Welcome again to a message from Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Swansea. So good morning to you. I hope you're well and you're looking up. Only a week to go and we should be back in the real world, albeit in a kind of different norm. Uh, but with that said, we will continue with online uh, for the foreseeable future too. Main difference will be that we will try to be live on YouTube during the service. But we're not entirely sure how the internet connection will be, whether it be good or not. It may well be great uh, or not. <laughs> um, but of course, uh, any recordings thereafter will be edited for the afternoon. And that will be the same for those who phone in on Swansea 940446. You can continue to do that each week as well. Uh, but of course, it won't be available until the afternoon Um Website still at mountcalvaryswansea.uk And uh, so I want to apologise for those who wanted to try to join me for the devotionals during the week. My voice has not been great, uh, still not fantastic now. Um, so uh, I'd like to say that we will be doing them this coming week. Um, but I can't guarantee it at this moment, so I won't know till the morning of each weekday. Still, you can keep up with the readings on the website. It's fairly easy, really. It's Psalm 40 and 41 tomorrow. And there's two Psalms per day from Monday to Friday. So that the following week, you should start on Psalm 50. So Psalms 40 to 49 this coming week. Um, so I'll let you decide how fast or how slow you want to go through them. So now today, I want to take a step back uh, to a passage, which I think is one of the most central to the church and whilst we are traveling through the acts of the apostles and we have already reached chapter 5 i want to go back to a foundational statement that is found in acts chapter 2 specifically verses 42 to 47 and even more specifically now to verse 42 so let me read those few verses and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. If uh, what is here in these few verses were truly taken to heart, then perhaps uh, we would um, see growth again. Um, uh, the numbers are increasing in the church worldwide, but here in the UK and in Europe, in North America, they are decreasing. In fact, in Wales, uh, where I am right now, two or three fellowships are closing every t every week for the last time. And perhaps even more will fold as a result of the uh, pandemic. In fact, the latest ep uh, estimate from Barna is that 20% of churches will close directly as a result of this virus, of this covid but what is the real cause of the closures? It's not really the virus, is it? So does it have something to do with what is contained within these verses? Well, I think it does. Uh, there are many, many churches like this one throughout the land. And, um, and unless the Lord adds to the numbers here, uh, we could find ourselves also in the same predicament in the not so distant future. And there are many books about how to keep uh, churches open or to see church growth as if there is some sort of formula. But these formulas are the same kind of things which are written for diets and sometimes they have uh, a short-term effect. I'm a good uh, illustration of that. I lost three stone plus on a diet and then put four or five stone back on. But if you do, if but if you don't get the basics right, you cannot possibly achieve long-lasting change. And but today's passage is a formula, 
and it is a well-worn and trodden one at that. These verses are only helpful though if we put them into practice and it's here in, verses 40, in verse 42 that four things are mentioned. So there's the apostles doctrine, uh, there is fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. Now when I say that many are closing, uh, there are those who do put these four things into practice, but because they are so few in number already, um, and because the rest of the wider church is following some big shot from here or there, they are depleting the local church. Uh, many, when I was uh, preaching in the Welsh Valleys or among the uh, various fellowships there, uh, a lot of those who were from those places, they were going down to see the big names, those who who uh, they thought had it, you know. And instead, these local fellowships, uh, they were diminished. Um, and indeed, by being taught by some of these big names, it diminishes the Christian life. They are not truly being built up upon the word of God. They keep undermining the scriptures to say, well, give to them and God will bless you. Well, uh, in the last week uh, or so, Kenneth Copeland has been dropped from TBN, a uh, so-called God channel. And, uh, and we all go, hooray, because it's about time that such a heretic was shown the door. And I mean, he's lost favour, particularly during this COVID crisis, trying to cast out COVID and say it's the end and... Well, in fact, it had only just started at that point. But uh, who have they got to replace him? Is there someone equally shallow, equally an heretic in Stephen Furtick of Elevation Church? That's no improvement. And I, I say again, uh, to, I, do, I don't recommend watching God channels because they are populated with people who are uh, false teachers spreading false doctrine. It's very hard to know who are, truly are the good ones. Even those who people say to me, oh, they're good, you know, but when I check them out, they're quite a mixed bag. Well, the first thing that is listed in Acts 2.42 is doctrine. And it's really, really, really important. And it has always been dear to my heart. Um, and we only need to read the history of the church to find that this one, above all others, is the one that's targeted by the devil. All the others are targeted by the devil, but this one, this is the thing that, uh, that really uh, undermines the church. Heresy, that's what it's called. Anything that's contrary to what is called orthodoxy. And it must be tackled head on. And false teachers must be called out by name. You know, there's a difference between false teachers and those who uh, have fallen into sin. I think that uh, very often the church wants to call people out. Uh, oh, uh, look at that leader, he's fallen in sin. I, I'm not particularly in favour of that, to be honest. Yeah, we, we're, all we're all failures, we're all can fall. Um, but when it comes to false teaching, that... You yeah, really have a responsibility there to get things right. And that's why it says that those who teach will receive the harsher judgment. And uh, of course that is also upon me. How did the early believers get their doctrine? Because it was by the time that these ones are around in Acts, uh, the New Testament wasn't in its final state. Uh, Paul was still uh, just about on the scene. Um, and it wouldn't be for some time to come before it was all going to be ready, and including the Old Testament, which was still just about in its final state at that point. So how did they learn? They learned it verbally. Paul says to Timothy, uh, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will also be able to teach others also. So then those who were hearers were to teach others, and they were to be hearers who were to teach others, and so on. You see, that's how the faith is. <coughs> Today in the church, there seems to be little appetite for doctrine. I've said before that sermons used to be between one and two hours long. In, in some, some old Baptist churches, you would get three sermons from three different people equally an hour long. 
So that's, that's a three hour service just to listen. Of course, I think I would uh, like to preach if my voice was up to it uh, for, for such, such lengths of time. Uh, but we struggle through ones which are 20, 25 minutes long. What will we make of Paul's preaching that went on all night? Fall out of the window asleep? As indeed that young man did. <laughs> That's what we would do. I'd fall out the window. <laughs> Funny enough, Spurgeon, who is considered one of the greatest preachers of all time, uh, also complained that people only seem to be interested in hearing a 30-minute sermon these days. That was 130 years ago. <laughs> There are thriving churches where uh, the preachers are preaching for 40 minutes plus. Of course, how long a sermon is doesn't mean anything. Of course, it's the content, isn't it? But it's the fact that people are staying to hear proves that people need to hear the word of God. And we are in such a privileged generation. We have the Bible in our own language. Uh, we are also literate. You know, we can read for ourselves what God's word says, but so few Christians really do. Which is why I always keep pressing these reading plans. I do. I did a free year one, uh, didn't I? And now we're in the Psalms, and we're going to continue on. And maybe God willing, next year we will continue on through the rest of the Scriptures again. What well, Luke wrote in his Gospel so that his patron, Theophilus would gain an understanding, and we in turn will gain an understanding. So hear what he has to say in Luke 1, 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So doctrine, according to Luke, is something that you set forth in order and is a decoration of those things most surely believed among us and are instructed. And are instructed so that we may be certain, certain of what we know and understand and believe. <coughs> So how did people in the past, oh by the way that word instructed there is the word where we get the word catechism from. So that leads to the question, how did people in the past learn doctrine? Well there were a number of ways. People became, when they became Christians they would be baptised and rightly so. But first you would be indoctrinated. <laughs> That's a word we hate today isn't it? But lessons were used to be given in a question and answer format. That is what we call a catechism. And when they were together, uh, someone would read aloud portions of the scripture. Of course, in, in later years, that became known as lectionaries. Uh, these are still used in mainstream churches. It reads a portion of scripture from the Psalms, from uh, part of the Old Testament, part of the Gospel, part of the New Testament. And in that way, they would hear vast portions of the scripture. <coughs> uh, of course, lectionaries are only so good so far because they do miss out quite a bit of the scriptures. Not all the scriptures are in the lectionaries. And understandably, really, because they're a three-year rotation. Um, and they're not reading it all out uh, on Sundays. <coughs> well, remember, it's only in recent times that the general public could read. And before, it was just the monks, the priests, those who could afford to be highly educated. But always people can hear and memorise. That's what they used to do. And Jesus said, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And then people also learn doctrine through the sermons. And each generation of people who become Christians are to obey Jesus' command to make disciples and teach. That's that word, doctrine. To indoctrinize to uh, everything that he instructed. And to also then it also gives us a foundation. It helps us to deal with the onslaught of the enemy. Paul said that in the last times people will not endure sound doctrine and that to me seems very obvious today. And that, what does that mean? We must be in the last days, right? There's another prophecy coming to past, pass. 
But <clears throat> doctrine is needed to give us a right understanding. Of course, doctrine can divide, and that's often been used as an excuse not to do doctrine or to go for the lowest common denominator, the simplest of all statements that all Christians should believe. But the problem with that is that God's word makes doctrine especially important. It is mentioned over 220 times in the New Testament. So doctrine, it comes from God. This is something that he requires and division happens when we fight with what God is saying. Another thing that can be said is that we can be more right about doctrine than being right in our attitudes. Because that is absolutely true. That's true of everything, isn't it? Uh, the claim then is that being right in our attitude is more important. Well, that's actually false. We have to be right in our doctrine with a right attitude. A right attitude with a wrong doctrine is just as wrong as a wrong attitude with a right doctrine. Our attitude is rightly adjusted with right doctrine if we allow it. Right living should align. The early church, they thought doctrine was very important. And what does it say here? Is uh, They continued steadfastly. I think that's what the NIV says. They were resolute, unwavering, constant, loyal, faithful. And as in the reading uh, today, they were devoted to it. Devoted. They continually devoted themselves to doctrine. And it seems to me like uh, it's something you have to rededicate yourself to doing. It's not a one-off. It's not something that you just do when you first become a Christian. It's something that you have to do every day that we are a Christian. Uh, today it's even more necessary for us to understand, to have right doctrine. We live in what's called a post-modern world. No absolute truths. All is relative. Well, mind you, that's not really a new thing, but it's, that's beside the point. But the thing is, that's a lie of the devil. God has absolutes. He can never change. His truth, his word, his ways and God himself are unchangeable. The technical word for that is immutable. He does not and cannot change. We need to know who we believe. We, and what we believe. And why we believe. Because we are shaped by whom we believe. And what we believe. And why we believe. Not all doctrine of course will lead to a moral change in our lives. Though that's the aim of a lot of the sermons. But it's not the main aim. The main aim of a sermon is to give God the glory. Much of doctrine has to do with worship, not ethics, right and wrong. The more we know about God the Father, God the Son, God His Holy Spirit, and the work that they do, it causes us to be more amazed, more in wonder. Doctrine formed the basis of hymns like Jesus the very thought of thee, and Jesus the name I love to hear, and and can it be? And so on. Doctrine led to worship. If, if uh, I preach on the incarnation, the wonder of God infant becoming flesh finite, it should lead to worship, along with that great host of angels declaring his praise to the shepherds. <clears throat> and of course that then should lead us to share in the good news with others. To teach. Doctrine is the foundation of the rest of what is said in the verses here in Acts. We have all of scripture available to us today. But because Christians are too lackadaisical, they have taken in uh, they are taken in by false doctrine and false teachers. Now Paul calls them wolves, and there are many of them about. Now to the church at, uh, at Ephesus, Paul said in Acts, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Well, the wolves in this instance were those false teachers, though they were Judaizers. They thought that the Gentiles should be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. But the gospel is one of grace by faith. A group called the Ebionites were the next in line, believing that they should be poor, follow the law, reject Paul. 
and accept only the book of Hebrews as their New Testament. <laughs> we have still people today whom we call legalists. Now there is no wrong in right living, but right living cannot make us right with God either before or after we are saved. And that was an issue in Paul's day as well as ours. O oh, foolish Galatians, Paul says in Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly, publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh? And just in case we are those who would go to the other end of the scale and say, well, we can do whatever we like. Well, Paul is equally clear that we cannot. For we are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And in Romans he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I personally am concerned for the church at large. It's dispensing totally with doctrine. It's all feel good and it's like the world really. Tozer, in his day, said this, It is now common practice in most evangelical churches to offer the people, especially the young people, a maximum of entertainment and a minimum of serious instruction. One can only conclude that God's professed children are bored with him, for they must be wooed to meeting with a stick of striped candy in the form of religious movies, games and refreshments. But doctrine is essential, otherwise we will entertain heresy and we will pass it on to others. Paul says in Ephesians, We should no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. <clears throat> we have to get with the early church and recognise the value of doctrine and praise him who has revealed himself and his purposes to us. We do ourselves and God a disservice if we are not interested. Devote ourselves to this noble cause, to know God and to know him better. This is not some feely ecstasy type of thing. No. It is first and foremost through the written word that we learn and mature as Christians. Peter speaks of this. He says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We should have a hunger and a thirst for doctrine that comes through the word of God. If we do not, then we need to ask God who will liberally answer us. And then, let us devote ourselves to it. And when we come together next week, at the service, in the church or online, we shall then talk about something else that we should be equally devoted to. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, your word is really, really important. And you've given it to us because, Lord, you want us to know about you, to understand you, to know who you are and what your purposes are, the plan of salvation, the fact that you want to be with your people, all of these wonderful things where, Lord, we can learn how great thou art, Lord. And we just want to bless you and thank you. Who is there like you? Thank you for loving us that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into the world to save us sinners by dying on the cross, by rising to new life, by ascending to the right hand of the throne. And one day, Lord, you'll be coming to take us home with you again. In the meantime, you have left us your Holy Spirit to work in us, Lord, to witness to you and, Lord, to teach others those wonderful truths that we have also learned. Help us to learn your word and what you have to say uh, in a deeper way that we may know you better for this day and forwards. In Jesus' name. Amen.